Join us, friends. Great Scott Spot Guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost Spot Guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the Spot Guy. Sadly, Trey is not with us on this particular one, but I'm going to go ahead and bring our special guest in. And uh, friends, this is Kaylee. And Kaylee is gone. I don't know what happened. There she is. Okay. And uh, okay, I got you, Kaylee. Okay. And uh, so that happened faster than you thought. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> so it doesn't take just a second. So, friends, Kaylee has a, uh, a podcast that she does on YouTube and also Rumble that's called True Crime Deep Dive. And I will put a link in the bottom of this video. And also, if you're listening on regular podcast platforms without video, I will put a link in your description so you can find it. But Kaylee, tell them how they can find it just quickly on YouTube or on Rumble. Um, on YouTube and Rumble, the same. I mean, if you just type in the search bar, the at symbol and true crime deep dive, no spaces, all one word. Okay. And it should come up in... Um, my use it'll show Kaylee, which is my username, but my handle is um that's how you can find me the at true crime deep dive. Okay, so Kaylee is K A Y L I is the spelling. So yes. you look for that, you'll know that you're in the right place. And and go yes. ahead and of course hit the subscribe button first, and then go ahead and, and jump in there. And I've listened to some of your podcasts, and uh I know that you do a you you basically uh, do what you say, a deep dive. You dig into things and try to unravel it, try to bring other people in that may have some information to try to get to the bottom of, of whatever it may be. And we recently had a thing here in Nashville uh, that you and I talked about, about Riley Strain. Yes. And you have kind of dug into that. So tell us a little bit about the Riley Strain thing. So um, I kind of stumbled upon it. Um like most cases I do, I don't really go based off of what's being talked about on the news because, you know, they those are the ones that are getting a lot of attention. And, and I've noticed they kind of water it down or, you know, they will try to create a, a narrative that won't, and, you know, and they don't want people to panic. So um, I kind of dismissed it because he was all over everything, TikTok and just everywhere. But then, you know, a friend of mine, well, actually another mom of a missing case that um, I've worked with for the last year, Alex's mom, she was like, I, I really think you could be of use of, you, you know, with the things that you've helped me with, with, you know, Alex, just take a look. So I was like, okay. And then before you know it, I was wrapped in it because I was just, just the, everything that they were saying just did not make sense. You know, I understand drunk leaving the bar, which is the narrative that they have. And he just stumbled into the water. But I watched your video where from when you were down there live and a couple of other live streamers that were down there. And I'm just like, that's just simply, I mean, it, it's possible, but not. He'd have had to stumble over the whole homeless encampment to get to the water. You know, there's not, it's not like it's just the riverbank. So I just started kind of digging a little deeper and kind of looking into the, uh, the stuff that goes on on Broadway and the bars and stuff. And it just kind of led me into this rabbit hole of, um, you know, it's kind of a common thing for college kids to be, you know, taken advantage of, separated from their friends, and then they get rolled and pickpocketed. And, um, you know, and sometimes if they put up a fight, they end up in the Cumberland River. Hmm. And it's just kind of really escalated the last couple of years. I know the last three years alone, they're same thing. Bar left the bar, was seen walking on camera and found in the river. I, I found at least six, seven, and that's a lot. That is a lot. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned and, you're thinking that they're being roofied and that kind of stuff down there. I don't know if that was necessarily the case with Riley because, yeah. you know, he he was 22 and he was not a very big guy. You know, he was very uh, tall and linky. And um, I'm I'm sure a couple of drinks is all it would have took and he would have been buzzed. But him falling on the security camera and looking like he hit his head, you know, it kind of rung his bell a little. He could have been concussed and, you know, it wouldn't have took much for him to go unconscious if there was an altercation or he fell again. You know, it's just I have the hard time with how did he get from there to the water and in the condition that he was found in, you know, no pants, no wallet, no boots. And 
you know, and then just they're so quick to say no foul play and we're not investigating it. That's just it just doesn't sit right with me. And obviously it doesn't sit right with his family either because they had a second autopsy done and there's no water in his lungs. So, um, you know, that usually requires so drown. Yeah, right. Which means and, he uh, wasn't. So so that goes back to what you were talking about It's kind of like they're trying to control the narrative more so right. than crime. Uh, because right, they the don't truth. Want to be afraid to come to Nashville. And, right, because it's a touristy tr attraction and come and spend money, but they're not doing their due diligence to make sure that when you do come and party, that they make it back home. Yeah. You mentioned something to me about uh, people, about this crime syndicate that is stealing cell phones and that kind of stuff. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I um, I see this feel on, like it's happening in Nashville. Oh no! I know. I I the, the I think it's Nashville Five or Na Channel Two, maybe both. They reported on it where they um they did a a statistical like FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act, where they pulled the records from cell phone you know pickpocketing incidents from the downtown bars that are owned by celebrities and Luke Bryan's and uh Jason Aldean's right next door to each other. There was literally like over a hundred, I think it was 111 in the last year that, you know, and that's just the ones that were reported, yeah. but they, you know, that, that if you go look at their reviews on like Google reviews or Yelp, like there's literally every weekend, 20 to 50 people complaining that their iPhones were stolen right with them, like out of their front pocket or out of their, you know, their shoulder bags because it's, they're so body to body in there that somebody bumps up against you. And before you know it, they're gone. And then they, a couple months later, they go to check, you know, find my iPhone and it's in China. Wow. You know, they, um, they actually did a, like, I think it was inside edition did a, you know, they did a whole thing where they followed it and try you know, and followed it all the way back to this warehouse that, you know, buys phones off of the dark web or whatever that is the black, you know, for, um, a said price. And then they sell it and for parts, you ship it over and uh, they get a bunch of them at a time. So it's not suspicious with the FedEx and ship them over to Shanghai, China. And, but they just made 500 bucks, 200 bucks, depending on how new the phone is. Wow. And, you know, and they have a, a mark, you know, like a target of, of, uh, you know, based off of how you're dressed, if you have nice clothes on and nice shoes and nice jewelry and they'll watch you and they'll watch what wallet, you know, which pocket your wallet comes out of if you're using plastic or paper and study you and then to wait for their opportunity to, for you to just have that one drink too many and, before you know it, you go home with a, you know, a bruised up head and uh, your bank account's drained because they took your phone and used your face ID to get into it and took all your money out of your cash app and transferred it to themselves. And uh, th they've had rings that led back to like Miami. But, you know, it's just these little groups of people, five or six of them, and they'll literally just go in and split up. And two of them will go this way, two will go this way, and they will come back and meet in the middle with so much stuff people's jewelry but mostly the biggest common thing right now is iphones because were, everybody's got their iphone absolutely and you were saying that um that these groups will like travel here with that specific purpose that's oh yeah mm -hmm. and and they wait and they'll see on facebook groups and stuff where they know like there's going to be a big nfl game or there's going to be a um, a call you know college fraternities coming in or graduate and they'll wait for you know those kind of uh, opportunity opportunities to come and they will fly in and then they'll, they'll rent a rental car and they'll do all they're going to do in a rental car. And then they'll ride a Greyhound bus back. So it's not suspicious. Wow. And uh, I've not experienced any of that stuff here. When I was in Paris, somebody warned me, they said, when you get off the train in Paris, that you will get pickpocketed in the train station. You got to be very, very careful. And when you go to the front of the train station, you got to be very careful. And when I got off the train, I had this, I had this eerie feeling that like people were watching to see what I was doing, to see if they could pickpocket. So I was very cognizant of holding on to my phone because I'm in another country. If they stole my IDs and stuff, I'd be in, you know, so I was really, really specific about it. But if you're not thinking about it, uh, right. It would be so easy for that to happen. And I actually went to, I can't think of the name of the graveyard, but it's a graveyard that the, uh, um, the lead singer for The Doors is buried in. Um, what's his name? Uh, come on, Billy. Um, somebody's screaming at the computer right now. Um, 
Uh, I can't think of his name. But anyway, I was at that graveyard and I took my backpack off. It was before I was leaving Paris. I took my backpack off and somebody had unzipped it. They didn't get anything out of it, but it was completely unzipped. And um, so I, I was really, because somebody warned me, I was very cognizant of it there. But that's really the only place that I ever felt like there was a high probability somebody was going to pickpocket me. So I was really watching, you know, to be careful right. about it. But now I think it's everywhere. You know, it's a thing, yeah. especially these kids, when they're going down there. And look, I was I was young once. I remember going in and doing stupid stuff and and going into a place and drinking too much and putting myself in that kind of a position. I'm lucky that something didn't happen to me, you know. But when they're out there in the city walking like that, especially where he was walking, the further that he walked, the more into the darkness he was going. There's nothing. Right. There's nothing positive past uh, when you when you get off a of first and get on Gay Street and start heading that way. It's complete darkness out there. In fact, I mentioned to you that I did the bridge ministry. Gay Street. If you keep on walking down Gay Street, it'll come up to a uh, a place where there's a uh, an apartment complex that used to be like a factory and it's got a, a roof over it. The apartments are mm -hmm. under the giant roof. And if you stay straight right there and go to the bridge, that's where we did the bridge ministry at. It's literally, it, Gay Street stops and you have to turn left and go back over to, I guess it'd be second. Um, and that's where we did the bridge ministry. But all that stuff has changed. You know, there was a tornado through there. There was a, a government building to the right of the bridge that um, was for like uh, food stamps and social security and that kind of stuff. It got taken mm -hmm. by the tornado a few years ago. There's nothing but a nothing but a, a concrete slab there. Now it got destroyed. And yeah. so the further that you get out there, the the less lighting it is, the more dangerous it is, the further he got that direction. You know, he's basically which leaving crazy. town, which is crazy. Because the, po yeah. the police department is literally right there. You know, yeah. the, the justice department or the yeah, the sheriff's department's across the street, and I think the jail used to be there. I know yeah. they took part of the jail down and built a new one. Now, tell the folks about where you think Riley was heading to with the name Tempo in it. There's a theory. Right. Well, I had this theory because I was uh, doing a little bit of deep diving just kind of in the beginning stages when he was still missing and just kind of trying to retrace retrace his, ste his steps on uh, Google Map and Google Earth just to kind of get a lay of what businesses are there and see if I could spot any cameras. And I noticed um, whenever I typed in because I was like, well, let's see how he got mixed up. You know, let's see if he was leaving the bar. Like, let's type in his hotel, no his hotel, you know, name and see where he should have went and see what could have went wrong. And immediately, as soon as I typed in Tempo, I, you know, with my location being that I was at Luke's 32, it directed me toward to this Tempo tech place, which is right next to the Justice Center, mm -hmm. which is, the you know, the last place that his phone pinged almost like that's where he realized that he messed up. You know, mm -hmm. oh, crap. You know, I'm, this is not this doesn't look familiar. I shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. But the from the bar to the hotel uh, it's only five blocks, but it was five blocks the opposite direction. Right. So he when he took a right, he should have come out and turned left. Right. When he took that right on Church Street, if he have took a left, he'd have been all right. But he took that right. And and it was, you know, he just went to no man's land. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, 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 I and think he was exactly he was, um, you know, he's from Missouri and and being intoxicated just was not paying attention to the fact that, hey, this is not what you know, this doesn't look familiar to me. This doesn't look like the motel or the hotel. You know, he was just looking down at his phone, looking up and probably just, you know, stumbling along, not to mention the head, you know, falling and hitting his head. He was probably just literally trying to drag feet to get there. And there was a mama that spoke to him with her family that was like, Hey, are you, are you not driving? Are you, you know, you're, yeah. she, she recognized that, that he had some issues, you know? Right. And yeah. Cause right he said that he she's on gay street. Yeah. Right. She said that he turned around and told her cause you, that's when you see him looking back in the crosswalk footage and he's like, no, I can barely walk a straight line. Yeah. Or, you know, that was his response. So she just wanted to make sure he wasn't driving, but she assumed that he didn't have to go far, you know, well, but, you know, hindsight being 2020, she, she feels, you know, she wishes she would have made sure that he got to where he was going, but he didn't look lost at that yeah. point to her. So that makes me feel like he was confident in the directions he was following that he was on the right track, you know? Yeah. And I think the she reason didn't ask for directions. she asked him that she, because she knew there was nothing down there. But right, except the parking garages. Exactly, exactly. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no reason and, to be going that direction unless you're going to your car. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, it is it is a place that people get almost bullied into having to park there, yeah. you know, because there's no available. You know, if you're not there at wee hours, there's no available parking that you're not going to have to pay an arm and a leg for. So they make the affordable parking. You have to go all the way down there. And there's no Ubers or anything because they have all the streets blocked off where you can't drive. So mm-hmm. you have to walk to one of the cross streets, which is pretty much where he was at to, to even get an Uber or a taxi. And it's mm-hmm. apparently it's not easy to get him to come down there. I mean, they'll come, but the wait is, you know, you, somebody in that state of mind is going to say, oh, I would, I just forget it. I'll just walk. It'd be faster, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the so cost of that, parking downtown Nashville is crazy talk. It can sure. be anywhere from 40 to $60 to park just yeah. for one, you know, oh, for just a few hours to be downtown. Right. Yeah. And I've heard that like, they don't play like once you're past your time, like they will come and tow you. Absolutely. They will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they sure will. Yeah. And uh, very, very funny about it. And and that's, and all those things lead to a bad situation. Yeah. All of right. Them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the whole, you know, throwing him out of the bar, you know, I don't, I doubt they'll, the bar would be liable criminally, but they may, the family may end up having some kind of, you know, civil, you know, litigation or something that I feel they should be entitled to because, you know, it was whatever they're not saying, but uh, it's something it was personal that they felt that Riley rubbed them the wrong way. And the staff made a staff decision to throw him out. Not necessarily that it, because they thought he was overserved. you know, it's been coming out a little bit more and more that um, the family friend said that he, he had a, he was doing something. He was trying to do a good deed for someone else. And it was interpreted wrong by the staff. And, you know, and I'm just like, well, how does a good deed get interpreted wrong? You know, mm-hmm. I could, my mind goes 50 million places with that. Like, oh, well, did he see something and, and say something and the, they didn't like that? Or, you know, like, how does a good, doing a good deed get you separated from your eight other buddies and thrown out on the bar by yourself? And you're probably the most, you know, out of all of them, he, he was just, you could just tell and look at him and he just screamed vulnerable, you know, just mm-hmm. baby, baby, you know, like, you know, the wasn't, um, uh, weightlifting and a confrontational or anything of the sort. Like mm-hmm. his mom even said that if he bumped into somebody on the bar, he would, he would buy them all around just to avoid a fight. That was just mm-hmm. the kind of kid he was. He just, he was not that type of kid. And that is something that could have been studied and watched too, you know, just, well, I wa- there's a story that, that, when he was thrown out that one of the guys that was with him came outside with him and they had a conversation. What do you know about that? He, he, one of his frat brothers walked down, walked down the stairs with the bouncer and they threw, threw Riley out and the friend frat brother went back upstairs and continued to party with the rest of the buddies. But he said to the family that because he tried to leave with Riley, but the, the staff wouldn't let him leave because they had to go pay a tab. But then the bar came out since then and gave a statement that said that's not true. They don't even have tabs. Everything's pay as you go. That the friends were more than welcome to leave. You know, they, if they stayed, it was on their own choice and their own free will, not yeah, because they were not, not allowed to leave. That'd be too hard to keep up with as many people as is in there. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Yeah, yeah. So it's that's an odd thing. So let's talk about uh, Alex that you were mentioning before. Oh, Alex is a case that's really, really close to my heart. Um, it's actually the what made me create a YouTube channel and even get into it. I just was, um, I was listening to a case, um, another case. I think it was Summer Wells, and uh, there was a little intermission on one of the channels that I followed at that time. And a mom came up, and they were talking about how they had gotten, um you know, into a bad situation where they tried to hire a PI that ended up not being a real PI and ripped off for their money and just completely broke my heart. And, um, I connected with the mom, which her name was Ashley and, um, you know, just kind of asked her, you know, is there anything I can do? And she was like, I would be willing, you know, whatever. And I I didn't even have a channel at that time. I was just a person that watched YouTube And, you know, I was like, well, this is what, this is what I'm willing to do. And I, you know, I created a channel for probably the first six months to a year. It was just all Alex all the time. And there's a lot of information about his case that his mom has because she had his, all of his phone information and his Google. So we literally like tracked his every step of his phone. 
and just got really, really down to what we know and what we don't know and couldn't get still cannot get law enforcement to do anything about it. Where did and this happen at? Holmes County, Mississippi. Okay. And um, so what it is very, is, that? is there a major uh, city Pickens, there? Pickens, Pickens, okay. Mississippi. Yeah. And uh, it's, I think the, uh, the capital or the, what, where it would be, what it's most known for would probably be Jackson. Oh, okay. So it's, it's close to Jackson then. Okay. Yeah. And it's about an hour, 30, 45 minutes away from Madison. Okay. So what and, happened? Well, he, um, he got out of jail that day. Alex did. And, uh, he got dropped off at his friend's house. His mom dropped him off there and come to find out it was his, his dealer. And she didn't know this until after the fact. And he just, he goes there and the phone leaves the property about 12 minutes after he got there. And then it just kind of goes blank. You see him on camera walking off, but then there's gaps in the camera footage and just a bunch of stuff because the, Ashley didn't know that that was um, the heroin dealer, but the sheriff and the DA and everybody that's a, uh, of power knows about it and, and nothing, you know, and, and it doesn't have any plan of doing anything about it. And, you know, it's just kind of led down all these rabbit holes of all these overdoses with fentanyl that have been tied back to this same person. And, um, and he's still out doing, you know, do business as usual today. And th the sheriff has been the sheriff for 38 years. Um, so these people off, I mean, it's gotta be something like that. It, it, it is, um, it is the most in, Corruption and, corru you know, just it at its finest. I've never seen anything like it. It is it just blatant in your face. Like, we don't care if you know about it because what are you going to do about it? It's, you know, and the way that they treat this, this mother that is, you know, missing her son, like she's a, you know, like she's annoying them, you know, when she's, when you're doing your job or you should be, but they just have no interest in helping. Everything that's been done search wise is all been done by, her and us on YouTube, like they will not participate in the searches. They will not even be there to make sure if there's evidence found that it would be admissible because of chain of custody. They've just completely refused to be of any assistance at all. So he's literally missing. Yeah, he's still missing. I mean, Ashley in her heart knows that he's no longer with us, but he's never been found. So what are the circumstances? He got dropped off at the dealer. Mm -hmm. And then just disappeared from the dealer's house. Did he yes. owe him money or what? I mean, yeah, that's all things that we've kind of been in my podcast. You know, we've the different layers of it and can, you know, just the, okay, could this have happened because he got out of jail and the first place that he went was there. Maybe he owed a debt that he needed to go, you know, see to, or maybe they thought that he was snitching, you know, and that could, you know, there are all of these different possibilities, but it's just speculation because there's no real investigation being done. They told his mom that because he's 30 years old, that it's not a crime to not tell your mom where you're at. Well, you don't understand the bond that these two had. Like it is completely out of character and, and he's not just out there not calling his mom, mm -hmm. you know, and he's not just his mom, just anybody. His phone went radio silent at, you know, at this, we can pin it down to the minute, you know, that the last time his phone pinged and, um, you know, and it was yeah, yeah, on this property in the, in, in the yard of the dealer the drug dealer's house. It's mm -hmm. the last time it pinged. So the mm -hmm. only time that it stops pinging, just like Riley Strain, is when the phone either is turned off or it's destroyed, one or the other. Right. Yeah. And just like with Riley, we know from the metadata that it, it had battery charge, so it didn't go dead. Yeah. You know, so it was either turned off or thrown in the water or something. You know, it was compromised. Yeah. And I want to bring up something, and I'm, I know we're jumping around a little bit, but let's go back to Riley for just a moment. So I have a theory, and you if you watch my video, you saw where when you get mm -hmm. under that bridge, there's a a small wooden fence, if you will, an abutment. And when I say small, you could step he could step over it as tall as he was. He could literally step over the top of it. And um what I think may have happened is he paid his tab, put the credit card in his pocket, he walks there and steps over that thing, and it's real steep. And then it drops off like 30 feet to the rocks right. down there. But it rained that night. I've not heard anybody talk about it, but it rained. It did. So if he fell on those rocks and then it knocked him out or whatever, and then he died from that, and then it rained, the water level raised and it washed him away. 
is a possibility. And when he flipped off of there, his credit card flew out of his pocket. That's just one right. thing, a, a, one possibility. Right. And I think that's the most probable because on the body cam footage, he just seemingly, when the cop does his little, you know, walk and turns around, you see him going one way. And when the cop turns around, you don't see Riley he's walking. Yeah. Right. So he's stepped off somewhere in between where he walked past that cop and where the bridge is at and where you're talking about where that opening is at would be right in that area. So maybe if he stepped off because he was like, oh, you know, I'm sure probably his heart was pounding 90 to nothing because, you know, trying to act like he's not, you know, I don't want to get in trouble for public intoxication, or maybe he was going to go to the bathroom or maybe even had to throw up. I mean, all things are in the realm of possibility, but with that already hitting his head, it wouldn't have took much for him to lose his footing. And like you said, and to render him unconscious or even unalived at that point, but that would have put him right on top of one of them. You know, somebody seen something or heard, you know, something. I'm just, I'm exactly. And I'm just, I'm just got a real hard time the water was seven feet higher than it normally is that night because of the rain. Um, I've, I've looked into that, which the current was significantly higher, but I just have a real hard time because I I've picked through that footage, the sur the surveillance of the justice building, which is right past that bridge. Mm -hmm. And there's just a lot of activity right in that time, right after the body cam that I just found very strange to it, to not be considered looked into, you know, the people running, from where right, you know, where that area was at and almost looks like drag, you know, dragging somebody back. Like I saw the I've seen that footage where it looks like there's two men, two men and a woman carrying mm -hmm. something. And, yes. Um, and they're heading back towards that bridge. Right. Yeah. Some somewhere in that area. Yeah. That's which, which if you think about it, there's no way to get down to the water from over there. I mean, there's the you know, you could get down there to the there's no way to get from there to the water there's another fence down there where that abandoned building is at between yeah. the, the wall and the water so if they had to get down there to drag him all the way down they would have to go to the other side of the bridge yeah there where you're talking about if they threw if he fell over that that uh rock wall right. it's flat down there it's a big flat right. spot probably right. what, 40 feet maybe or something like that before it gets to the water so, absolutely yeah. and, but it's every good of five six feet down just yeah. you know yeah yeah, Straight it, drop. It is. It's a pretty good drop. Oh, it, I think it's further than that. I'm gonna say it's 10 yeah. or 12 feet. So yeah. But whatever happened, his phone stopped at shortly thereafter. So if he fell and his Apple water, Watch, right at the in simultaneously, right. But they were connected to Bluetooth, so that could be you know when they lost range from one another, that could be why, or because they went to the water at the same time. Right. You know. Right. And I was just that was a an, a side thought. So let's get back to um to the other case. So this guy's just gone. Nobody, his body. He is went missing. He went, was last seen on April the 20th of 2022. Wow. So it hadn't been that long ago. Um, so there should, should still be a lot of, of evidence. But the thing is, is you're in a small town that's corrupt. It sounds like. Right. And yeah. they're in very under, you know, they don't even have uh, technology, everything that you can think of that most police departments are, you know, they're, they are way, way, way behind, you know, they are, uh, they don't have public records access. They don't even, you know, have mug shots and accessible when they arrest people, like everything is pen oh, and paper cool. log and just, yeah, very, very, um, it's, it's, it's bizarre, very bizarre. Cause you know, it's almost like, is it, it would be, how do you just get away with not updating when everybody else is updating? It's almost like it's more beneficial for them and their lifestyle to be, Oh, well, we're not, we're not equipped. We don't, we're, we're not smart enough. Well, that's a cop out, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's an excuse to not have to do anything, but there's no, um, there's no checks and balance. There's a, you know, the sheriff and the undersheriff are blood brothers, which is nepotism everywhere else in the United States, but apparently not there. It's just like every, all the rules just don't apply there. And people, other agencies won't touch it with a 10 foot pole. As soon as you say Holmes County, Mississippi, they're like, huh, they laugh at you. Well, good luck with that. Good. You know, I, I, I'll pray for you. I'm very sorry that uh, your son ended up on the wrong side of the tracks, but that, you know, that he knew what he was getting into by being over there is kind of the way that it gets treated. And it's everything that's been done investigation wise has been done by Ashley and her family and um, the help that she's gotten from YouTube creators, me and a, a podcast called a sip of justice. 
he did like a five part series that went into depth. That is really, really, really good job. Just about Alex and who he was and his story about addiction and, and you know, how he, how he got to where he was. And it just very good job about going into it. But my, my podcast is more like everything in between the phone data is what I focus on. And really like, we just broke down the metadata to where it was like encrypted, you know, like it was code and, you know, we transcribed it line for line and it gave us latitude and longitudes. Mm. And literally we tracked his every step down to minute to uh, if the phone was tilting and what accuracy it was tilting at. And, and it went flat to the point we have a, you know, a theory together that he was running through the backyard and then he went flat and the phone just never pings again. Like, mm. you know, like, you know, and it's not hard, you know, the gyroscope is, you know, what that goes based off of with Google and the Google timeline data. But the only reason Ashley was able to retrieve that data is because she knew Alex's email, you know, Google password and email. And most moms don't have that. But, you know, thank God she did because the police have not done anything with warrants or, you know, for she's been asking for two years to, just to see if if their phones were together in the same spot, you know, do some kind of geofencing. Mm -hmm. And they're, oh, they're, they're waiting on a warrant. They're waiting on a warrant. Like, it's it's the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. Like, but yet they come and they threaten her like, oh, you know, we're going to put trespassing charges on you because you can't be out here looking for your son. Like, yeah, on, you, it ran off the prop. They had cadaver dogs come. They were volunteer, but they were, you know, search and rescue dogs. Cadaver dogs hit in the man, in the drug dealer's yard. They ran him off the property, said, oh, no, 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 no. He didn't go back there. He didn't go back there. And they've never been allowed back on the property since. That was day eight that alex was missing and i think he's on like day 700 and something ashley so she does an update every day they're involved it sounds like yeah absolutely yeah. there you know the he sheriff willie march uh, he calls uh drug dealer nephew you know but that is could i don't i don't i know there's no blood relation that i can find but it's definitely endearing you know it it not what my sheriff would be calling the local heroin dealer that's you know yeah, that's scary. killing people's uh, kids because yeah. it's got fentanyl in it. Yeah, that's scary, scary stuff. So what other cases? I know you mentioned that you really worked hard on two different cases. And Chris Watts case was one that I really got deep into the different elements of it. Um, the That one was kind of a big, uh, just the way that it was closed, open and closed so fast. It just, it was crazy to me. I've never seen a case open and closed all the way down to this trial, the sentencing, everything from um, the time the case started in August and November, it was closed, done trial and everything. Hmm. And I've, that is fast. And it just, the, his confession did not match the physical evidence. There was not much of an investigation because as soon as he confessed, they stopped investigating. And I think that they did that to protect the people that were involved. And it was heinous. I mean, it, you know, it was in Colorado, I think 2018, but he, he killed his pregnant wife and two kids and, you know, put them in the oil tanks at yeah, where he worked. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, it just didn't sit right with me the way that it was just so open and closed. That That's usually what gets me. Like when the police are just like, you know, we're, this is how it is. And we're not going to look into it anymore. And I'm like, well, um, let me see what I can you know, find it. Yeah. But it, when there's so much evidence and then there's nothing done, I'm just very good at being persistent. I'll start petitions and get a thousand signatures and, and I'll go above you. I'll go around you. Like that's just, you know, the kind of stuff I do or I'll call every day. And, and I've been calling Mississippi every day for, I just stopped here recently the last couple of months because it's the same thing, but I called probably every single day, twice a day for at least 10, 12 months and got the same, they wouldn't even talk to me. We don't talk to media. What? What do you mean you don't talk to media? No press conference. No, no. Well, can I get an update on the case? There is no case. Uh, he's missing it. There's no criminal element to it. How? Mm -hmm. Yeah, based you know on how? Yeah, yeah, like you, do you know something that I don't? Because I'd love to get a statement. Like how? Yeah. How are you? How are you doing? Coming to that conclusion? Mm -hmm. That's that's wild. Yeah. And it, it's sad though, because you know, it's just, you know, he's got a daughter, a little girl that's now his mom is, you know, t got custody of and is raising. She's five years old and, you know, and she sees him on the missing posters around town and, you know, and she still doesn't know, you know, like, it, you know, where, where's my dad? Like, you know, and is she finally asked I, not too long ago if, uh, 
if her daddy was in heaven and Ashley told her, uh, well, he, he might be, he just might be, but I don't know. And she said, well, that, that, that's the, I didn't get to tell him goodbye, you know? And she just, it's just sad all the way around because the sheriff told Ashley's dad, um, that, uh, Oh, he, he over, he overdosed, came, got out of jail, came back and went back to the mount that he was using before he was in jail. And, uh, got a hot shot and um he they got rid of him and you'll never find him he's gone 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 that's what the sheriff told her dad wow and they said oh he'll he'll come up a couple counties up in a few months because that's what they do they'll drop him off in a field the next county over well that hasn't happened you know there's all these bodies that turn up and no alex no alex and and i if he overdosed why why i go to the extent to hide him because it's not a crime you know for somebody to overdose now they have as after Alex went missing, they have the Good Samaritan Act where if you call and give someone, you know, get them medical treatment, you won't get in trouble for, mm -hmm. um, you know, for whatever it is that they overdosed on. But so there, there's not that element of a uh, fear getting in trouble. But I, I just almost feel like he's on that property because that's the only place he knows Ashley can't get to because mm -hmm. she's been everywhere else. She's been in the in the swamp and the muck in her little muck boots just out there looking with her her own volunteers and the only place she can't get by law without a search warrant is on that property and that's hmm. where the dogs hit and that's where she wants but and th and then there was a fire big fire you know there's a burn ban across the entire state of mississippi we were um kind of promoting that uh, she was doing a public search and to search the uh, bridges in right there in goodman and in pickens and because she had a tip that came in and that he was uh, tied up and weighted down with concrete and threw off of one of the little bridges. And she she was going to have, you know, people coming all from Alabama all over that were coming to bring boats and their little sonars. And the, and we're going to help because, you know, the Big Black is a big river. And um, so word got out. This was Labor Day weekend that she was coming to search the weekend before she was to get there on Sunday. There was uh, her mom and dad were on the way back from church and drove through Pickens. And there was a I mean, a fire, not like a little fire. I mean, the entire side of the freeway was on fire. And when the p fire department came from Goodman, the volunteer fire department, he drug dealer met him at the gate, said, get the F off of my property. Uh, I, we're, I'm just burning pines. It's, it just, you would not let the fire department on the property. But yet there was an active burn ban. And where he burned is coincidentally where the dogs were trying to go. Hmm. So it's almost like hard to not speculate and say that's could be where he Alex was at. And then who knows if it was at Alex or evidence or, you know, it just seems a little suspicious. The timing has anybody flown a drone in there just to get an uh, overview. Oh, uh, it's so swampy there. Yeah, they did at the beginning. It was actually MBI, which is a Mississippi, you know, the FBI version of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And they found a couple of things on there that anomalies that ended up being, you know, nothing related to Alex, a cooler, a tarp and stuff, but just nothing that um. there's so much trash. And, you know, it's just How like much a does this guy have. Oh, he's got quite a bit of property out there that's um that that isn't rightfully his, but the people around it either are related to him or work for him, and they are equally as uncooperative. I see. I can't so believe it's uh up the fire department with an active forest fire going on. I didn't. Yeah, a burn ban. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, everybody else in Florida, you 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 they came and put it out, and you'd have had a very hefty fine yeah. on you know for but. It's like the rules don't apply to him. Hmm. That's bizarre. Very. It's that um bizarre. It's almost like uh kickbacks or you know, like they get some kind of compensation for, you know, a percentage of what's going on there because they're de definitely not under any uh doesn't seem like they're trying to get stop the heroin problem, that's for sure. And he's on parole. I forgot to add that. On active parole for selling drugs. You don't need a warrant. He has no rights. You could mm -hmm. pro probation officer just come in and, and do a walkthrough anytime. You're not supposed to be around other felons. You're not supposed to be around guns, drugs, any of that stuff. And I guarantee you there's not a time of the day that he's not around all of those things. That is crazy. But, they just don't want to stop him. Like you say, that there's it sounds like they uh that they're all complicit. It's a right, and they probably make more money from him than they do from 
you know, what they would get. Jobs, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because, right. And he works for a real job at, as a contractor at a Holmes Community College. That's where he meets all these kids at. That's where he met Alex at. You know, he gets these young kids coming out of high school, you know, and, hey, do you want to make some fast money? And before you know it, they're addicted to heroin. And and that is a very, very vicious thing to, you know, vicious cycle that is very hard to get out from underneath physically because you get it so sick that um it, you just, it becomes a matter of normalcy. It's not even about, you know, wanting to get high. It's just not being sick. And before you know it, you know, you have 10 years of just your life just gone. Mm-hmm. And Alex was a good kid. He was, you know, and made good grades and just, one bad decision led to what led to two bad decisions and now he's not here anymore. Wow. That's, that's sad. How old was Alex? He was 30, 31 when he went missing. He's 33 yeah. now would be 33. Yeah. The young. That yeah. Is, is and, sad. um, yeah, he, he went to rehab and because the, um, the insurance only paid for so far of it, you know, he didn't get to complete it. And I think that is kind of really just what was the downward spiral. Like if he'd have been able to, do all 12 steps and get through it. it, I think it would have benefited him so much more, but because he got so far and then they kind of kicked him out and I think it discouraged him mentally. And, you know, he, it just didn't give him the skills to, to be able to be, you know, without it. And then COVID hit and they, everybody got the stimulus checks and everybody got paid to do nothing. And that his mom describes that, that just being the worst thing that could have happened. He was getting like $800 a week. And, le- you know, legally filling out the paper, checked all the boxes, and it was – he qualified for it. And he was spending – he it, that really ramped up his addiction. Mm. And then when they just cut it, then he started doing thing other things, you know, not so legal to, to maintain that habit because now he doesn't have that money anymore. And he became a slave to the dealer, you know. I'll, I'll fix a car for you. I'll change a tire for you. Or I'll go collect money for you. And just before you know it, you know, he – was at this guy's beck and call. And, I, you know, it could be money motivated that he owed money when he got arrested because when he got arrested, uh, he got picked up on an outstanding warrant, but there was other people in the car and who knows what they said. And, you know, if there was a, they all had drugs on them except Alex. And, you know, his mom thinks that he had something hidden in the car that somebody could have came back and got later because the cops didn't thoroughly check it, you know, but there's, you know, all these I different know. elements, thank but you. thank you very much. So, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I dropped that on you. What that means is we have about three minutes left. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're getting ready to wrap up. But that yeah. sounds like that if he's in the car, and the other thing could be that those people are afraid that he's going to rat on them or 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 whatever, yeah. Right, or they could have just went back and told the dealer that their version of it to make themselves look you know, better, and Alex is a snitch, and you know, there's who knows what Alex walked into when he came back to that house because it yeah. – the fact that he just disappeared from there says that it wasn't good. Yeah. And that, and, uh, and I've never done heroin, that kind of stuff, but I know no, that no. people that have, and they say that it's one of those things where that's why you just, kids don't do it. Don't do yes. it. No matter yeah, what, I, but they no. say it's a high that you get one time that you chase forever. That you right. You never and, get back to that. You know. Right. And then it's just a matter of not being sick because the physical withdrawals of you throw up and you, you know, you puke up blood and your bones ache. And it's literally like you, you feel like you're dying, you know, and yeah. you'll do anything just to, to make it go away. And then it's not you don't get to that high anymore. Then you just don't feel sick. And then, it, you know, the and it wears off the more you do, the, the longer, or, you know, the shorter the time is at last. And then now there's this <laughs> fentanyl. Yeah, epidemic and it that is you know you one time and you don't even know it's in there and that's all it takes. Yeah, you're done. Yeah. yeah, and they're lacing it with fentanyl because fentanyl is cheap and it makes right. it stronger. You know what they're and taking. it's addictive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and it's ten times more addictive than than heroin and morphine combined. You know, and so now people are have gotten addicted to it and are seeking it out by itself, and it takes like a pinky nail's worth to over you know grown adult to drop you and you could be exposed to it on accident just breathing it airborne you know the paramedics have to be extremely careful it's everybody in mississippi it it carries narcan because they either do it themselves or they know somebody that you know and it and they'll the addict will wake up 
mad at you because you've you know you blew my high but you know that because that there's it's it, it's a disease and it's very very sad if to to watch somebody you love go down that path because it they are not the person you know that they it's were no win situations what that is right yep because yeah. they'll still lie and things that they would never do yeah. morally well kaylee thank you so much for this this was a lot of fun friends make sure you check out her podcast true crime deep dive if you can't yes. find it the link will be down in, under this video or if you're listening on the podcast it'll be down in the information and uh and i'm going to go uh one of the things that, that we talked about doing is maybe i go downtown nashville and interview some of the homeless people and that kind of stuff and see if i can find something and yes that would be great get you some footage from down there and and then let you use those things to do some deep dives on so so that sounds yeah. really cool. That would be awesome. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this, Kaylee. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And check out her podcast, friends. Make sure that you go to True at True Crime Deep Dive. That's how you search it on YouTube, and you will mm -hmm. find it there. Yeah. And I think you will. Uh, how many episodes you got on there? Oh, I have like a 190 something videos, but I have them in, you know, playlist that they're about, I do average in like 30 or 40 a case. Okay. And, you know, I'll just add to them as I have stuff pop up. But when I get deep into it, I usually just pump out like a, a video, you know, a live stream a day and I'll just go down different angles and the chat will chime in and they'll see this. And it's kind of like a, a think tank and, you know, and just doing it live with the, you know, very interactive. And, um, but yeah, I, I'm pretty, um, pretty steady with at least at least a live stream every other day on something uh, a case but um it depends on what i'm covering at the time but i try to keep alex all the time and keep it where you know none of their names go cold if especially if they're not if they haven't been found haven't been found that's wonderful right. thank you so much kayla thank you so much